I'm uh, very glad to be able to be here with you. Um, much better here than where I've been for the last six years. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, and I would like at the outset to thank the BOP, uh, my case manager in the Oakland Halfway House, for allowing me as a federal prisoner to come and speak to you today. Thank you. Suddenly, there is a flash of bright lights and brazen shouting. Stand for count. Get up for breakfast, whether you want it or not. A wave of desolate terror sweeps over me as another day of dread begins. The smell of urine from the drunks and vomit from the junkies assails my nose as a hot, burning wave of fear crawls along my skin. Busted again after so many years as I wonder if this claustrophobic jail horror will go on for the rest of my life. Perhaps few of you understand the difference between jail and prison. Jails are places for temporary incarceration while the authorities sort out whether or not they've arrested the right person or if they have, whether they feel they want to allocate the resources necessary to obtain a conviction. Of paramount importance is the question of bail. Nowadays, in most important cases, bail is denied or granted only for what must be considered ransom. Progressively, the enormity of this insidious trap begins to dawn and dawn and dawn yet again. Conditions in the jails are abominable. One tolerates it by hoping for bail and trying to remain as calm as possible in the meantime. The guards are abusive, exercise and fresh air often non-existent. Conditions extremely overcrowded with a typical space of 25 feet by 40 feet having around 30 men with three toilets and one shower and steel tables and benches for eating. At peak times on weekends the population can rise to 40 or 45 which happens by putting mattresses between the bunks and on the tables until there is almost no room to walk and even little air to breathe. Since bottom bunks go to people who have been in the unit for a while, the top bunks go to the newly arrived, many of whom are junkies in instant withdrawal unless they have smuggled some heroin. As a result of being deathly ill and therefore immobilized while undergoing extreme nausea, they often can't make it to the toilet. Those on the floor or bottom bunks may be subjected to cascades of vomit. This is not an infrequent occurrence. In all my cases, bail has always been denied. The food is horrible, the TV on for almost 24 hours a day, loud and blazing, and everyone is in a terrible headspace, yelling over the din of the TV. The jails, while well nominally set up as short-time housing, actually turn out to be long-term torture chambers to force you to enter in a plea of guilty just to get out of the jail so you can experience the relative humanness of the prisons. If you decide to fight your case, which I always have, your time in jail is vindictively lengthened. My first time in jail fighting the Orange Sunshine case was 14 months. The second time, 24 years later, I was in jail 30 months. During this time, I was never let out for any time except for infrequent visits to the gym or trips to court bound up in handcuffs, belly chains, and shackles, as though a pacifist alchemist would spring at his captors with bared teeth. The outrageous vengefulness of my captors, because of an intellectually and spiritually inspired act of civil disobedience, because of prohibition of psychedelic sacraments, bordered on the insane. During this time, of things going from bad to worse, while days turned into weeks and weeks into months, with no conceivable relief in sight, I became hopelessly depressed. Gone was my home, gone were my loved ones, gone was my ability to move myself physically from a worse place to a better one. I was trapped physically, socially, and emotionally. In every direction that I turned, I saw despair. My money was gone, my beautiful laboratory was gone, stolen and auctioned to a motorcycle gang for a song. I was reduced to a plastic jumpsuit on a thin mattress in a small dark corner surrounded by hostile demons. 
an incessant din and nothing to do but think and think and think. The inexorable horror that this could be forever was looking more and more certain as the months crept by. The only anchor I had was my beloved Usha, who waited patiently and loyally for the five long years that we were to be separated. As time went by, I became despairing and depressed. I became very overweight. Eating the greasy food and not getting exercise and fresh air was also to blame. When I noticed that I could not go up a flight of stairs without wheezing, I became seriously alarmed. I realized that during these months in jail, I had done little but read trashy novels and go over in my head all the errors and mistakes that had led to my arrest and incarceration. I repeatedly fell into the woulda, shoulda, coulda syndrome as I futilely reenacted the past in a vain attempt to extricate myself from the frustrating self-blame I was experiencing. Around and around and around as I wound myself up into greater and greater degrees of despair. This was indeed a dark night of the soul. I realized that I had to do something to break out of the self-destructive cycle. When you graduate from the grade school of jail and move on to college level, you have made it to prison. The food is still bad, although considerably better. The guards are often more polite and given a chance even friendly. Quarters are still overcrowded, but conditions are decidedly improved. The headspace of your fellow convicts is less confused, and the terrible uncertainty of not knowing what will happen is gone. The most dramatic change is being able to go outside and feel the sun and the wind and to see the stars once again. There is a library, a school, a hospital, and the possibility of dental care. These rights have been won by prisoners filing cases over decades to bring conditions to light so that judges force minimal standards of decency in the federal prisons, although not in most of the state prisons, where conditions are infinitely more horrible, I hear. In the prisons, you almost always have a yard where you can walk, run on the track, lift weights, or do any kind of exercise that you want. The worst part is over. You have made your mistakes, acknowledged to varying degrees your responsibility, and now get down to doing your time. There are, these are the major differences between jail and prison. Meanwhile, back in the jail, as my physical and mental condition worsened, I realized that I had to get out of my circular, repetitive, and stultifying headspace, or I would be in even worse trouble than jail. Accordingly, I asked Dushi to send in a book on yoga, and I began to diet and do 20 minutes a day of yoga, which soon became 30 minutes, then an hour, and eventually three hours a day. My disposition brightened and became more positive. I lost weight and altogether started to feel much better. Usha started sending in books on ethnobotany, anthropology, psychology, and most important, the works of the enlightened masters. And after so many years of working, I was finally able to catch up on my reading. I realized that freedom was the burning issue in my life, and that even though my physical freedom had been eliminated, my ability to trip inwardly was completely my choice. Naturally, I was regarded as an oddball. My customary acceptance of people without regard to race or religion and my conversations with anyone at all was regarded by many of the other whites as treasonable. And I was told that in jail this was possible, although not acceptable. But in prison, I would have to join up with my own kind or suffer the consequences when I got into trouble. I replied that I hadn't seen these people helping me much and didn't think I would need that kind of help. I was told that I would see. I agreed. In prison, the racism was rife, both among prisoners and staff, as it is on the outside also. But the microcosmic viewpoint made the divide-and-conquer techniques of the people in control much more apparent. Racial issues everywhere always obscure the more fundamental issues of human and civil rights. I continued to relate to any friendly person whom I could help or relate to in prison also. This had the effect of alienating some people, but in the long run, I was accepted by everyone, 
because I would simply not eat out of the dish of racism, and I stood my ground. As the yoga kicked in during my first year, I also started catching up on the newest books on transcendent consciousness, both Eastern and Western. During this time also, quite spontaneously and irresistibly, I began to write. Every morning, my hand picked up the pen and dragged me to the table and made me write. So there was my day, three to four hours of writing in the morning, yoga in the afternoon, and study in the evening. This was really good for me, and I began to realize that whining about my situation was idiotic, and I would be much better served by learning how to do my time. Instead of mourning over my situation and bleak prospects for the future, I learned to see that no one exists in misery who cannot find someone who has had a worse deal of the cards. In fact, we are all doing time in the jail of life, as long as we don't stay completely present, responding to each situation as it arises. Reliving the past to regret and depression or worrying about the future are unreal activities that have no relevance to the present. The advice of the old timers in prison is to do one day at a time. And so I moved into this timeless mode and the days passed with increasing tranquility while my position vis-a-vis -vis my legal situation worsened daily. First my lawyer Peter went into a total emotional breakdown, and most of the remaining money I had disappeared with him. That finished my chance for immediate bail. Then the authorities figured out who I was, and the U.S. filed extradition papers to serve my old 15-year sentence and a new five-year sentence for absenting myself in 1976. The charges in Canada were not looking very good either, and kept increasing and worsening. In addition, my cattle were being stolen, my ranch under fire by unscrupulous employees, my machinery was being stolen, and sources for legal funds were drying up. My new lawyer, Ian, was a prince who dismissed my concerns over his fee and still came for hours every week to console me or discuss my options. As each of these heavy blows came to pass, a wave of despair and depression would crash over me. It was at this point that I realized that every calamity that befell one in life was governed by a compensatory mechanism. Within each dark cloud, there really was a silver lining, if only one would look for it with enough diligence. As I looked deeply into each misfortune, I realized I was looking at my expectations and attachments. If I let go of them, I could see I was undergoing no misfortune at all. It was just my mind. The reality of the situation was that, in fact, I had no problems. I had free living quarters and food, hot water and light. My clothes were provided for. Great books were being sent in by my beloved. If I simply accepted the life of a monk, there were no problems at all. If everything went wrong, I would still be cared for by existence. If not, I would still be cared for by existence. If I got convicted, I would be living inside prison. If not, I would be living outside prison. The point was that I would still be alive and vital in the world. My heart would beat, my eyes would see, I could still be surprised. I could still have revelations. I could still love. In these simple abilities, I could find all the most satisfying things in life. When one looks at one's situation as a calamity, even if you are being preyed upon by a parasitic system, you are allowing this form by unconscious mental intention. It is important to realize that the participation in the feeling of victimization is the engagement of one's person as that very victim. By participating in this process, the host that is one's self is now made vulnerable to the parasitic system. Letting go of these feelings is the doorway to internal freedom. Once you are free inside, external freedom is extraneous and illusory. I began to see that this life could be seen as an intentional dedication to a purifying monastic life in which one renounces all worldly pleasures and material involvement. All I had to do was to make this intention, and all my activities 
would be experienced as a purely spiritual life. Indeed, it was the life of a sadhu or wandering monk. During my six years of imprisonment, I was moved through 16 different institutions and had my quarters changed 41 times. That's a total of 57 moves of sleeping location in 72 months. That's a move every six weeks or so with concomitant loss of personal possessions and allowed items changing at each location. I even had to hide contraband pieces of dental floss in my legal papers so that I could practice dental hygiene. Dental floss is considered a weapon or escape paraphernalia. Naturally, arrival at each institution was accompanied by extreme paranoia and suspicion by the hosting prison and the usual testing by prison guards. Because of the frequent goading or bullying, these people were routinely referred to as pigs by the inmates, who also had their own access to grind. Embittered by life and having few opportunities, they were in the revolving door of perpetual return to prison for increasingly longer times as repeat offenders. The guards, too, came from similar origins of limitation, and almost to the man had basically the same values and attitudes. Often guards came from the same neighborhoods as their wards. Nevertheless, the roles of guard and convict, captor and captured, master and slave, create a perpetual enmity with social rules and protocol which must be observed, lest the prisoner be thought of as a snitch, or the guard's position be compromised as a breach of security priorities. Within this custom is a constant testing, guard to guard, guard to prisoner, prisoner to prisoner. No one's position is secure, and the watchword is constant suspicion and skepticism. This creates a miasma of gloom and negativity, which is a prerequisite to a relatively peaceful life in prison. Some of the rules are never talk to guards, don't talk to anyone not of your own race unless it is for business, always greet everyone you pass, don't ask questions, don't smile or talk too much. It took me a long time to overcome these attitudes and the insulting behavior of those around me as I followed my own set of rules for respect and interaction and sidestepping the inherent double binds. I adopted an attitude of total acceptance of what was going on around me while I remained completely aloof and aware. If unreasonable demands were made of me, I did whatever was necessary without getting involved in conflict or negativity. I observed and rooted out impulses to react in anger or fear and allowed all external probes to pass through me without getting caught. As no energy was being generated by the reaction, there was no place to focus. Continued negativity and the issue would then evaporate. This act of transparency was effective with both guards and inmates, and as long as I didn't allow them to feed on my negativity and also didn't participate in feeding on anyone else's, the whole question of combativeness and reactive behavior dropped away. All of this type of activity is, at that point, seen as a total waste of time. Not participating in this popular pastime gave me much more energy and time, and I began to move into two or three hours unmoving meditations, which were quite surprising, as meditating more than 40 minutes had previously always given me a backache. Now nothing of the kind occurred. Meanwhile, years had passed, and for a while things on the legal scene became quite horrible. After a couple of years, I was finally returned to the States to do the old 15-year sentence and stand trial for bail jumping. The old hanging judge, who had given us outrageously long sentences back in 1974, was miraculously resurrected to give me the maximum five-year sentence consecutive to the 15-year sentence. Twenty years in all a total of about 12 to 14 years more of real time. As I was approaching 60 years old, this was tantamount to a life sentence. Nevertheless, my resolve to move into my inner freedom continued to strengthen despite the illusory clamor of demons vying for my attention and despair. All of a sudden, even though I had completely accepted all that was happening, Miracles, according to the lawyers and cult consultants, 
began to take place. In slow motion, my nine-year sentence in Canada disappeared. The appeal court threw out the bail jumping, effectively making me immediately eligible for parole. I was told not to be disappointed if parole were denied. At my first hearing, I was granted parole. During this time, I was writing to Eckhart Tolle. He read one of my letters and commented to Usha that I would be getting out even earlier than I expected. When Usha relayed this message to me, I asked why he said that. He said it was because I had completely surrendered. Now I was perplexed. I had already been recommended for parole. I was only waiting for approval or denial of the examiner's recommendation. Two months later it came. I had been approved for parole, but the unheard thing was that another six months had been cut from my sentence. No one had ever heard of this happening before. The last miracle. We live in a many-layered, psychosocially recreated reality, manifesting on many different planes simultaneously. On the individual level, it can affect our immune system and life expectancies. On the social plane, we participate in a wash of reciprocal expectations that reflects an atomistic and separated view of reality. The unitive tide of evolution in which we are all moving is not noticed. It seems that we are like the two amoebas caught in a vast tidal flow. One amoeba turns to the other and asks, where shall we go today? It is in this individually limited and separated view where we find the real prison. The escape from this prison is the concern of all spiritual work, and what it seems is that the direction in which evolution as a macro-universal force is taking us. As I spent the next few months waiting for the bureaucratic process to catch up with itself, I spent my time in meditation and walking the fence line. By this time, I was seeing the fence as an illusion that separated the outside world from the world of prison. In reality, there are two prisons. The obvious one, inside the fence, wherein a microcosm of the customs of the outer world may be more easily observed. The outer world of language and custom and culture into which we are conditioned before we have any say in the matter, any awareness of it, is harder to perceive. Caught up by complex currents of ambition and expectation, clinging in loneliness, as we strive to maintain a separate identity, we remain imprisoned in the illusion of need and survival, playing an unconscious role in an unsuspected play of vast proportions. From the time we are born, we are imprisoned in language and expectation. Then we are handed over to the schools to be molded by robots unaware of his or her own imprisonment. When we are finally allowed to be released after a 12-year sentence in grade school, we enter blindly into another jail of marriage and parenting, careers and roles, and more schools, until we finally die wondering poignantly what we missed and why there is this vague dissatisfaction and unrequited yearning. That yearning is the desire for freedom and oneness. Only by going beyond our boundaries and limits into the vast field of consciousness beyond word and time, will we find that beauty of love and unity and total freedom. Until that time, as they say in prison, we are all doing time. But it is this very time, this time out, that by simple and exacting intention can function like a Kajifian stop exercise and allow you to move into that inner space where your mind stops and you move into the essence that we share with all existence. One of the things I felt as I realized that once again I had lost everything I had built up on the material plane for 20 years was a burning feeling all over my body. It was the realization that everything I had been clinging to for some support, some transient trite reward was gone. The work was gone, my distractions were gone, and all that remained were my attachments burning up in a blaze of purification. And when this was over and I could laugh about it again, I realized that I had regained my freedom and that every activity I found myself in was a meditation in motion. And I was very grateful that I was lucky enough to have been ripped loose from everything but beauty and truth and love. 
Janis Joplin expressed this exactly when she sang, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. So I had this gigantic gift of time to reassess and reevaluate the most important things in life, to see that the multifoliate visions that we experience in our life need time and love to integrate and prepare for the next steps. The psychedelic vision can be used to see all the possibilities of crafting consciousness, especially when all that you have loved and cherished is suddenly gone. It is like a near-death experience on many levels. Not only are you broken from all your attachments, but you must be very respectful and walk softly as you move around other suffering inmates, for the specter of death looms around every corner. And in the far distance also death waits at the end of a long, empty life of unfulfilled desire to taste and love and dance under the stars, to walk in the woods and to have sweet moments with your beloved. Great perspective and so much time to catch up on all these inner plans for growth that we keep putting off until a time when we are not so busy chasing the illusions of the world. This is the chance once and for all to choose joy over misery and to make that decision that yes, I am going to choose joy as my goal and whatever horrors I am surrounded with I will transform into beauty. That as an alchemist I will choose the soul as my laboratory and love as my stone. In this place where I realized that I had no real choice in life, I was going to utilize the illusion of choice to opt for transformation. It is just amazing what you can do with intention. One of the most important stories I heard during this time was about the meeting of an old Tibetan man trapped in a deserted village. For up in the Himalayan wilderness, uh, up in the Himalayan wilderness by crippling arthritis, when asked how it was having to live, trapped, alone, and immobilized, he replied, perfect, especially since I have no choice. This was a great key for me, a teaching that showed me that whatever we are given is always embedded in the choicelessness of existence. We think we make choices, and I suppose we do after the fact with our rational minds, but the beauty of the gift of life is that all you have to do is see the choicelessness and realize the importance of the love that we are here to share. So I began slowly to see how everything that occurs in life can be seen as love and that the trick was really to see that everything that occurs through that transforming vision. A young man is driving through the countryside and he sees a field full of very beautiful, ripe, lush pumpkins thinks to myself, hmm, well, I've never done a pumpkin. So he gets out of the car, he walks over, finds himself a beautiful young pumpkin, pokes a little hole in it, starts working away. Unsuspected, a policeman walks up behind him. Officer Brenda Scott says, Sir, do you realize you're screwing a pumpkin? He, quickly thinking, he looks down at the pumpkin and he says, Is it midnight already? It's really all about transformation and putting these myths to work for us as we free ourselves from conditioning. Although we can choose the realness of negativity and skepticism, in the end it seems that through the gift of time and space we are given the opportunity for self-transformative intention. Every misfortune that comes our way is a wake-up call. It is a reminder from existence not to miss doing this dance, not to miss doing this dance between deaths. Every time we fall asleep, it is like a small death. And when we awake the next day, we have the chance to experience the delight that this brief visit into the play of form, the dance of illusion that this life gives us to move into beauty. I am reminded of the story of the Zen master on his deathbed, his disciples around him, Knowing he was going, they asked him to tell him the se tell them the secret. Looking up at the ceiling, he said, Can you hear the sound of the squirrels running on the roof? This precious jewel of life, so poignantly brilliant in its setting of death, is what we are given to see the beauty around us and to use this vision to move into love 
and as we do, we feel existence. Take us by the hand to bring us home again. Thank you all for your generous support and kind wishes. It has been a big part of why I am able to be here with you today.